What is up, sports fans? Welcome to the Sports Opinions Podcast. This is episode seven. I am your host, Alex Cuesta. With me today is a guest that you all might be familiar with, all 25 of you that listen to this every week. Um, he was on the second podcast with uh, KDOC. It's Mr. Matt Santos. He's been asking to come on one solo. He gets his wish granted. What up, Matt? How you doing, Alex? I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. And yeah, I guess, you know, everyone knows a little bit about Matt. Matt is was supposed to write for a little bit for me on the blog. Hasn't done that yet. <laughs> Hoping that he eventually will. He used to write for this small little website called the AOSN. Pretty good don't, website. Don't help them out. Ah, listen, the, you know what? They gave they gave both me and you a start in the writing with uh, a little more flair and a little more uh, notoriety. So definitely give them a little bit. But um, so Santos, is he knows his stuff when it comes to almost all sports. He's a soccer player, played for OCC. So he uh, knows what he's talking about. OCC. What's up? He's on the bench for OCC. I mean, but you also play club and stuff. He's a soccer aficionado, knows his stuff about baseball, claims to know basketball, but we'll challenge him on that today. Uh, uh, the Nets aren't any good. And the Knicks are so much better, but we'll talk about that. We're not talking about the Knicks. <laughs> oh, we will. We will talk about the Knicks today. But first, we're going to go on to what's happening like the most important thing in sports right now is the NFL. And I don't think there's an argument about that playoffs time. It becomes the biggest topic, uh, right off the gate. I'm going to put it right to you, Santos. Who's your Super Bowl pick? Who you got? Uh, I got new England and I got the Vikings, new England and the Vikings. Oh, funny thing. I have <laughs> new England and the Vikings. Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you see in either of those teams that are going to get them to the promised land? Oh, uh, well, the Vikings have a great defense and, well, no offense really stands out except the Saints in the NFC, especially with Carson Wentz hurt. And Case Keenum's played good enough. Well, he's played better than good enough. He's played at a very high level. He has a good passer rating. He has a good touchdown to interception. And uh, I think he just has to be good enough for them to make the, the Super Bowl. And, you know, New England's New England. Yeah. I don't really think I need to explain it. There's not much I need to explain, but you touched <laughs> on the Saints. And for me, the Saints are a weird team this year because normally when you talk about the Saints, you think Drew Brees throwing 350 to 400 yards a game, getting 45 touchdowns, 40-something touchdowns in a year, no defense, high scoring, no run game. It's been the polar opposite of that this year. They have a ridiculously good run game. The defense is uh, probably the best we've ever had in New Orleans ever. And Drew Brees isn't doing as many Drew Brees things. He's actually looked his age this year, I think. Um, they're not relying on him as much. Do you still have the faith that if Drew Brees had to, he plays, um, they play today, I think. Um, if he has to get into a shootout today with Carolina, is he going to be able to keep up? Oh, yeah. They, they 100% can keep up. I don't really. I, I think you're insulting the team with asking that question. I mean, he doesn't even have to do it himself. Yeah, they have Alvin Kamara. They have Mark Ingram. Plus, I mean, all you have to look at is Michael Thomas's stats this year, and I think that really tells the story of, of what kind of, of – if Drew Brees could still, you know, air it out. You know, he had uh, 104 receptions for, 1200, for over 1,200 yards, and he only had five touchdowns, but – he was averaging 12 yards of reception. His uh, Everything's gone up from last year as far as that goes except the touchdowns. But, I mean, Michael Thomas has really been a uh, beneficiary of of uh, Drew Brees in his first two years in the NFL. So and, they don't miss uh, Brandon Cooks over there? I mean, they do. But I, it's not like they don't have Willie Sneed still. And they all, and now they have an added weapon in Camaro, who I'd say is way more versatile than Brandon Cooks. Coming out of the backfield, he could catch, he could run. And from the University of Tennessee, and I, I mean, if you need to pound it, you have Mark Ingram to come in and pound the ball, third down, stuff like that. You can still throw the ball to Mark Ingram, though. I don't know why you would if you have Camara. They run screens. But Ingram can catch. It's not like he's yeah, uh, Ingram, he's not yeah. fat out of the backfield. He's very serviceable. He's been serviceable his whole career out of the backfield. But, I mean, it's like, I, I don't know. He's why, more why valuable he... between the tackles, obviously. Yeah. But um, so uh, is it fair to say that, uh, you know, obviously the game, we're recording on uh, Sunday the 7th. It's 430. So the Saints game is about to start if it hasn't started already. And um, 
But regardless of their win or loss today against the Carolina Panthers, is it safe that the Saints were your sleeper team for a Super Bowl pick this year? Oh, absolutely. I love the Saints. I love Drew Brees. I love Sean Payton. Defense, don't love it, but it's better than it has been. And I would, I would, I would argue this is the best team Drew, Bre- Drew Brees has had, and he won a Super Bowl. So, Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, he won a yeah. Super Bowl with... Barely, you know, he had a serviceable run game. He had an opportunistic defense that was Ben Don't Break when he won. They weren't a good defense. They just made timely interceptions. And, you know, they just didn't. They would let teams do whatever they wanted within the 20s and mostly hold teams to field goals. So it's not a terrible defense. They were a very Ben Don't Break during a Super Bowl season. I agree. This is easily the most complete team that Drew Brees has ever been a part of. And, you know, normally you're comfortable with that, and I'm comfortable, but I just don't think that they're the best team coming out of the NFC. I mean, I don't really think any team stands out in the NFC, to be to be fair. Absolutely, and I think if you look at it with, like, quarterback play, quarterback play is the big thing. Drew Brees obviously stands out, but I think in the playoffs, I don't think Matt Ryan is up to the task, but I think Cam Newton's the best quarterback in the NFC right now, so it's really a battle right now of... Is the best quarterback in the NFC going to will his team back to uh, glory? Because, again, Cam Newton, when they played in the Super Bowl, what was it, two years ago, three years ago, he willed them into it. And this year he is willing them again into championship contention if they win today. So Uh, It's any given day with Cam, though. Shows up, doesn't go his way, doesn't want to play can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you, but I don't think it's ever that he doesn't uh, want to play. I, you know, he's asked to do so much. He just, he's asked to run the ball in goal line situations. Like, Jonathan Stewart doesn't do it in goal line situations. It's Cam Newton running in goal line, which is insane. Mm. But, um, you I know. Agree. I with, agree. I, I don't know. I just, the best quarterback, I, I don't know if it's Cam Newton. But I'd say it's Matt Ryan, but Matt Ryan's played awful. Uh, yeah, he hasn't played. He hasn't played up to snub, and you know it really shows what Kyle Shanahan did for him in that uh, offense. And well, just you go and you look at Kyle Shanahan with Jimmy G right now, and it's like holy crap, Kyle's pretty damn good. Obviously, Garoppolo is a talented quarterback. Well, I think it's Steve Sarkeesian more than anything. They just don't mesh. And sorry, but I'm you, not a Sarkeesian fan. You know, but that also goes to show like it, maybe it takes some time because Todd Haley and Big Ben didn't mesh. But now, that was in the beginning. Now, no one talks about Todd Haley and Ben Roethlisberger meshing. It's just, it happens. Todd Haley calls the plays. Ben runs them better. They understand each other. So, maybe it's more of they just need to come to a better understanding because the weapons are still there in Atlanta. Yeah, that's true. They have no sure. They have the ability to to wow you any any week. Well, yeah, they have Julio. Julio can wow everyone. The guy's a monster. And they have Freeman still. and Tevin Coleman. Yeah, they're uh, just stacked. Tevin Coleman, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you're, it doesn't seem like you know. And it's funny because I talk to some people that are reverse. They think that Freeman is the mad guy and Tevin Coleman's more talented. So Look I think up it's the just stats, and, and they could come talk to me. Yeah, I think you know, but I think it's just all what your preference is too, in terms of uh, you know, Freeman is a lot more of he relies a lot more on his speed. Don't get me wrong, Tevin Coleman's fast, but Tevin Coleman would rather run you over than go around you, and Freeman's the other way around. So. Yeah. I mean, it's up to preference. So in terms of my Super Bowl picks, I happen to agree with Matt. I think it's Minnesota versus New England. Um, I think Minnesota, like you said, Case Keenum has played above his level. He's Him and Adam Thielen together have played uh, the best that they've ever played in their careers. Really um, taking the two teams, getting a chemistry. Uh, the run game, despite having Dalvin Cooks go down, has Latavius Murray stepping up and running the ball like a monster. Um, that defense is top notch and so I just think that in the NFC East there's not a more complete team right now than Minnesota Um, and if you look on the other side you have New England like you said they're New England Um, they just do things they just get there every year there's really they become like the Golden State Warriors Cleveland Cavaliers of the NFL where you just expect to see New England either there or competing to be in the championship game all the time um you know, and if we're talking about some sleepers, uh, my sleeper actually just played a terrible game against the Buffalo Bills, the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's <laughs> my sleeper Super Bowl team because uh, being a Jets fan, me, both me and Matt are Jets fans, but we remember the formula that the Jets used in order to get to AFC Championship games. Great defense, run the football. Right? Yeah, great defense, run the football, serviceable, if not under, uh, you know, underwhelming quarterback. 
And, you know, I just reminisce of the Baltimore Ravens who won a Super Bowl <laughs> with that team, basically. So, true. you know, and the Jags are going to do, if they can get past uh, Pittsburgh, which is going to be a task because Big Ben is going to struggle off a lot of these sacks that Jacksonville gets because he's a big dude, he's tough, and, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers line never holds. Um, <laughs> they just, he can run around for 33 seconds and they'll never hold in a game. But, um, you know, it's going to be a different test. If they can get past Pittsburgh, Jacksonville has the formula to beat Tom Brady. You hit the hell out of him. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's true. so if they can get to that point, like obviously getting past Pittsburgh is a tall task, but if they can get to Tom, if they can get to that point, they could definitely beat the, the Patriots. I think the Steelers are a tougher matchup for the Jags than the Patriots, which is weird to say ever in the AFC. Mm, I, I would have to. I don't know. The Steelers have the all have the offense that could put the pressure on that not very good Patriots defense. They do, but they they fall in love with that zone that they're typical. They play that soft zone throughout the games, and it works a lot because, like you said, the offense that puts a lot of pressure, and they do have some good rushers on that team. But against a guy like Tom Brady, you can't play a zone against Tom Brady. You have to play man. Because at least with man, if your guys are all covering really well for a play, you make him take that one extra millisecond and then he gets hit, doesn't throw a great ball, has to second guess himself. In a zone, he's a tactician. He sees the field like only so few guys have ever seen it. Like He sees it like Peyton, like Marino, like Montana, like those few guys that pre-play, if they know it's a zone, they already know exactly where the football is going to go because they know where you're going to be and where you're not going to be. So... It, it, you know, zones don't work against Tom Brady. And Pittsburgh got burned. You know, the Jesse James play obviously burned them. But they got burned when they didn't cover Gronk man-to-man, -man, left him to run in a zone free, and let Tom Brady march down the field. I, I, I'm personally not a fan of the Steelers team. I think they take a, advantage of a good situation being in uh, not the greatest of divisions. The AFC wasn't anything spectacular. They didn't have the hardest schedule in the world. I'm not in, overly impressed by the Steelers. Of course, they have playmakers, but really, when it gets down to it, their defense isn't the greatest. Their offense is explosive, but at times it's faded. And uh, I mean, Big Ben really hasn't hasn't been impressive all all too much this this year. It's been on and off with him. Uh, he had that run. He had uh, a lot of interceptions this year, more than. Well, it's been going down, going up each year, but uh, it'll be interesting. And I'm not even sure if Antonio Brown is at full strength. They tell me he is, but do you believe it? I I don't know. I don't he, know if I believe it, but I believe in Juju. I'm not gonna lie. Like I am not a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I actually not a fan of mostly uh, you know biased opinion. Not really a fan of the franchise as a total, but I'm a fan of Juju. Juju is that dude. Like, I can always yeah, – Juju Smith-Schuster is a guy that I can root for regardless of what team he's on. So, like, for me, I think Juju has shown that he's good enough that as long as Antonio Brown is there as a threat and they have to single cover Juju, he might be enough to really make up for giving Antonio Brown another week to get super healthy. As long as Le'Veon Bell gets 25 touches, they have a chance to win. Like, he needs to get 25 touches in some way, period. That is their only winning formula. For me. Yeah, well, personally, I think Martavis Bryant's better than uh, Juju Smith-Schuster. <laughs> Martavis Bryant thinks so, too. But you know what, though? <laughs> but you know what, though? It's kind of you look at it, and uh, Martavis Bryant, does he have all the talent in the world? Yeah, but what has he done to be able to demand this type of stuff? You know, Juju Smith-Schuster was quiet, was a rookie, got his chance, took it, exploded. I mean, he catches a lot of touchdowns, Alex, does he not? <laughs> I mean, yeah, absolutely. He catches touchdowns, but he's kind of a feast or famine. I haven't seen, you know, I think Smith Schuster is a better route runner from what I've seen. Like, you know, Martavius Bryant, I kind of find him more of the mold of like a Tory Smith or some of those home run guys. But he has a build, the six foot four build. Yeah, so does Stephen Hill. Uh, sure, but. Um... <laughs> like, plenty of guys have big builds, but it's, you know, yeah, if you could run a high 4 3, low 4 4, you can run by a lot of guys, but can you run a good hitch when it's needed at the sticks. I haven't seen Martavius Bryant do that consistently. I mean, he's caught 17 touchdowns in three years. So, oh, It's absolutely impressive. I think he'll be catching more touchdowns for another team next year, as much as uh, Pittsburgh said they're going to hold on to him. Uh, you know, he, if he's 
make some noise this offseason. I don't see a franchise like Pittsburgh uh, taking that type of crap. They'll get rid of them. They got, they've got they gotten rid of dudes who are insanely talented. You know, Santonio Holmes in his prime, Plaxico, um, Mike Wallace. They've gotten rid of receivers in their primes and not cared and yeah. always seem to Emmanuel have another Sanders. one ready. Emmanuel Sanders. They always have another one ready, and it's ridiculous. Yeah, it is. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. He's just – there's just something about the frame and the build. I, I can't I, – he's just more of a, a wide receiver that would fit into my team. Oh, it's hard to deny natural – like that – yeah, it's absolutely hard to deny like natural gifts. It's why quarterbacks who are – Six four, six five. You know, all American stature, big dudes get a chance more than your six foot Drew Brees types. Yeah, because you know you can't teach physical build. Like that's something you can't teach. But at the same time, it can only get you so far. Of course, of course. So shifting gears to the team that will beat the Steelers if they meet them in the AFC uh, Championship. The back to the Patriots. There was a report uh, from ESPN earlier this, uh, I think it was yesterday that it broke or two days ago, that there might be a trouble in paradise. The big three of that organization, Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, Robert Kraft, seem to be at odds and there seems to be a fissure that, according to this article, has been brewing for at least two years now, where Robert Kraft has seemed to throw in his... uh, backing with Tom Brady and Tom Brady's trainer and the way Tom Brady wants to do things. And Belichick is kind of being left on the wayside and uh, not getting what he wants like he's used to in terms of personnel. Like there's a report that he was forced to trade Garoppolo and a lot of things in this report, shots fired, definitely happened. Um, The Patriots came out with a statement saying that they are, you know, as uniform as they've ever have been. Their uh, goal is to win. And, you know, they said all the right things. You know, it definitely has to make you take a step back and think about when the reports like this come out, there is always some truth to these reports. What do you think about this report? Uh, I don't I don't really pay any attention to the report. I don't believe it at all. Uh, I mean, they got rid of Garoppolo because they can't, they can't, you can't franchise two quarterbacks, especially with Tom Brady. But what is there to say with getting rid of Brissett and Garoppolo and leaving nothing? Like, you have Brian Hoyer sitting there, but what, what if Tom Brady, you know, he talks about wanting to play till 45, but what if he, this offseason, turns around, looks at his absolutely smoking hot wife, his unbelievably sized house, the fact that he still is looks like a 22-year-old physically and goes... I'm not getting hit anymore. I'm done. And just walks away. Then what? Like, he let, they left themselves with no contingency plan. I, 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 I think they realized that Garoppolo's max value passed and that it was just going down from here because you were going to have to pay him no matter what. So, honestly, I think that played more of a role than this. I don't think they're worried about if Tom Brady walks away. I'm sure that there's things we don't hear about. There's, they don't make this move without... Tom Brady being 100% coming back next year and probably the next two years, to be honest. The man is a freak. He's going to play for another two years at least, and I think we could all bet on that. Yeah, and, you know, unfortunately for us, he's probably going to play for another two years, and I think he's going to be one of those guys where, you know, I think it's going to be even more, like, quick when he digresses than even with Peyton Manning. I think he's going to, like, play next year at an MVP level probably the following year uh, close to an MVP level. And then maybe if he comes back one year or two more, you'll still get like eight to 12 really good games. And then you'll see the drop off. I don't think he's going to be one of those guys where, you know, you're going to see it at the start of a season. I think it's going to be like later in the season when his body just can't take the hits that like kind of the way Brett Favre went out where Brett Favre could still throw the ball. He could still do everything necessary to play football, except that he just couldn't get up from hits anymore. Yeah, well, we have to see how Tom Brady ages, of course. Uh, for next year, he could get hurt right in the beginning of the season, like you said. I mean, he hasn't aged yet. Like, it's insane how, like, he's still, like, he's he's a Norse god. Like, I swear to God, the dude looks the same. Well, we have to see. I mean, age, age could catch up to you at any given moment. Oh, it always does. We've seen all of the greatest players in every sport. Age does catch you. Like, that is the most undefeated. The only undefeated thing in sports is father time. The oldest cliche, but it is completely right. You can't beat it. 
So shifting gears from, you know, the greatest team we've seen in the past decade of football to probably the greatest school in college football, Bama, college football playoff, Georgia championship game. First off, who you got? I have Georgia. Wow, Georgia. I don't think that's a popular pick. What do you think Georgia could do that can uh, beat Bama? Stifle them. I'm not impressed by Jalen Hurts. All that they have to do is keep it close. They have four. Oh, they have three. How many running backs is it? Three well, they have. Four, they, they, they have. They have all the running backs in the world. They're gonna. <laughs> they're gonna run that Alabama defense down. They're gonna attack them. They're gonna run in between the tackles. They're gonna look right at that nasty Alabama defense. Even Nick Saban said this is the nastiest defense I've had since 2011. He said, and they're just gonna run the ball. They're gonna pound it. They're gonna keep the the freshmen at ease. And the only thing I worry about for Georgia is if they go behind, I don't think they could catch up. But now the they... one thing I saw, and you know, last the game against uh, the Georgia versus Oklahoma game is an instant classic, unbelievable game. Baker Mayfield put on a show with Oklahoma, and I thought from what I saw from From From, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, what but From From what I but what I saw from him was he's a rock. He doesn't get shaken. He didn't have an amazing first half. Obviously, you know, Oklahoma was all over them. Came out in the second half and just played. He didn't, you know, put any pressure or too much pressure on himself. Obviously, I think it's comfortable knowing you have Chubb and Michelle running the football. But he did have to make some throws. It's not like he did nothing. He made some throws that game that, you know, a freshman in that situation against, you know, the the Heisman winner. He made, he made some throws that I don't think Jalen Hurts could make. You mean, I, I want to be fair to Jalen Hurts. I've seen Jalen Hurts make some pretty damn good throws when he stands back there and delivers. He has a strong arm. He's not the most accurate guy, but, you know, in college, you don't have to be the most accurate guy to be great. Tim Tebow was not accurate. His mechanics, though, his mechanics are awful. I just can't. Honestly, it's not. Yeah, he has a big arm, but he's not that accurate. But I have two words for you when it comes to Jalen Hurts and throwing the ball. Calvin Ridley. He's the best receiver in the game, in college. Calvin Ridley just makes plays for him and yeah, really makes him look a lot better than he is, but sometimes that's all that's necessary. If you throw it into the ground, though, you throw it into the ground. If you overthrow the guy, you overthrow the guy. He can help you, what, within probably five feet, five feet, you know, but his Martin legs, Weber. but his legs are also a big factor too. He's he's literally he's a running back that can really throw really well, and he runs the ball. He's tough. He has that, uh, you know, that Cam Newton, that Deshaun Watson, that Vince uh, Young in terms of uh, physical, not passing. In terms of physical, where you can, you know, you can have everything taken away downfield, and you can have him spied, and he's still going to get the first down with his legs. He's a very good athlete. So and all of them are very good at sure he's a very good athlete they're all very good athletes uh, you know I just can't discount Bama and for me one thing from Georgia is and where you know I'm gonna touch on this who has Georgia played besides Auburn that in the, the vaunted SEC East one of the weakest divisions in college football who had they played that they get all this credit for being this great team. Florida? You're going to tell me Florida's a challenge? Who have they I mean, played? South Carolina. Yeah, so, Mississippi State. Notre you, Dame. You're going to tell me. You know, Notre Dame. I, I'll give you Notre Dame. South Carolina, Mississippi State. Do they really scare you? They won their bowl games. Oh, yeah. Bowl games. All 41 <laughs> bowl games where literally, I want to say, out of the 41, but they, they, but they 31 of them they don't matter. Handled, they handled Auburn. And, you know, talking about beating Auburn, the team that got cheated out of the playoff, UCF, also beat Auburn. An Auburn team that beat Georgia earlier this year, that beat Alabama, ending Alabama's conference title hopes, which should have eliminated them from uh, college football playoff eligibility, according to Alabama's head coach, Nick Saban, last year, who said, (laughs) if you don't win your conference championship game, you shouldn't even be in the conversation. Uh, hi, Nick. You didn't even get to your conference championship game, and you were all sorts of happy you got in. You know, but break the rules for me. The rule that I set, but break it for me. But does it mean any? But it means more. Does it mean more to make it and lose, or does it mean more not to make it at all? I mean, you. It means if you don't make it, according to him, you don't make it. He lost. 
You, you know, the thing so with the college put football. Ohio State in over Alabama. I would put UCF in over Alabama. UCF so went undefeated. Put, but I don't think UCF, they're not going to give UCF a chance. We know this, though. I, Which is ridiculous because, you know, you look at it and the college football sure, playoff I needs. I understand why they don't put them in. I don't. I don't at all. Give them a chance. You know, the college football needs to start deciding whether or not. product, though. But oh, do they want the four best or do they want the four most deserving? The four best, they got it right. If you look at UCF's schedule, how are you telling me they're one of the four best teams in the country? You look at Georgia's schedule, how are you telling me that they, the SEC. They beat Notre Dame, they beat Auburn. They, sure, UCF beat Auburn, but they didn't beat them until a bowl game. You think Auburn wants to play in that, in that bowl game? No, I think... they, want, they had a chance to play in the national championship, but they lost. You know, they lost. if they win, they're in the net, they're, they're playing in the college football playoff. I mean, you know, you can make Auburn that. Wants to go out. There's 41 bowl games. Half of those teams don't even deserve to be be in a bowl game. The bowl games don't mean mean a thing. They don't mean a thing. I if I if I was going out there to play UCF, go ahead, let them win, let them have their 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 championship. Who I mean, I guess you can look at it that way. But for my argument's sake, is. It's it's whether or not they need to decide if you want the four best teams, then stop making teams play conference championships because they don't matter, obviously. When a few years ago with Baylor and TCU, you kept those both, both those teams out because they oh, didn't Baylor play a conference been, championship game. In the playoffs. Absolutely, but the reason why they were kept out is because they didn't play a conference championship game. So now that Big 12 plays one, Oklahoma gets in, but... Now you're all of a sudden, you're saying last year Penn State won their conference championship. Oh, sorry, it doesn't matter. We got Ohio State in because they're better. By what measure? For me, if you're that good, you make your conference championship game and you win. And you win your conference and you deserve it. That is... So, so it, what do you recommend? Every con- every every uh, conference has throwaway games. What do I recommend? All right, so I don't know. You, uh, I have an article out on my on uh, the Sports Opinions blog with the, the what I call the college football newest conundrum for me i think that the bias exists with especially the big 10 and the sec they get the most obviously because they're the two best conferences in football but the reason why is because they play so many conference games first off they need to get rid of divisions and conferences i think they're a joke the uh, big 10 west is laughable the <laughs> sec east is awful and you know in both of these teams if they win their division and then win the big 10 or win the sec oh my god they were great they won these conferences no they were terrible they played crap crap uh, teams to get there you're telling me that a team that in the friggin big 10 west that has a crossover division game against Rutgers in the difficult big 10 uh, east they deserve any more clout for beating Rutgers? like come on uh, but, then you get to, but then it gets down to, all right, well, if Alabama played Washington or if insert team here plays Washington's schedule last year, yeah, they probably win all those games too and make it to the playoff. You're telling, now, Washington went out there and proved themselves that they were a good team. But before they played last year in that conference playoff game, were you – I there were more people thinking they were going in there getting blown out than people thinking. But I thought Washington deserved it. I thought they deserved it. They won. They did their chair, job. But look at the schedule. They're playing in the in the Pac-12. All right. So hear me. So hear me out some more. So with what I want to do, first thing I want to do is get rid of these divisions. Do you agree with me that the divisions in these conferences are lopsided and terrible? Sure, but okay. I, but I don't think it's something you could just fix. All right. But here's my fix. You get rid of those. Number one. Number two. You play less conference games. There's 12 games in a schedule. Nine of them are conference games. You don't need nine conference games. Make six of them conference games. The other six are non-conference games, and those other six aren't decided by the schools anymore because so many schools play cream puff schools just to get those cream puff schools money and get an easy win. You let a computer decide who each team should play around the nation that are all championship-eligible teams to make it as even as possible strength to schedule in in, in, and coupling with their conference. So you wouldn't have... Alabama play their difficult conference schedule because obviously the you know SEC West is difficult, but then also play Saskatchewan State three times, They're like the equivalent of Saskatchewan State three times on their schedule. So then all of a sudden they have automatically nine wins because they played three week. You know what I mean? So yeah, uh, the at a conference will be more even. So then a UCF who goes undefeated in that type of style all of a sudden has an argument. Mm. It, it's tough. It's tough because how about the teams that have perennial matches that happen every year? Well, then you schedule them within your six. 
It's still uh, that's why you get rid of the divisions. Well, I mean Notre Dame is not technically in a con in a conference, but they have that agreement with the ACC. But Notre Dame plays the toughest schedule every year, every year, and they can't play in a in a conference championship to make up for it. Notre Dame is the one team where if they make a a a, a playoff, it's going to be because they earned it. They'll be the one seed probably because they play the hardest schedule every year. They're going to have to go undefeated. They don't have second chances, Notre Dame. They see, get one yes, shot. See, yes and they no. one loss. Yes and no, because every time Notre Dame gets through this vaunted schedule and we put them in championships, the modern Notre Dame. Old Notre Dame was beastly. Modern Notre Dame ends up getting laughed out of the stadium against better teams. And arguably the best Alabama team Nick Saban's ever had. And also, can we also talk about what other team besides Nick Saban's Alabama team can have a loss that late in the season and still get into the playoff. Urban Meyer, Ohio State. All right, but okay, so Nick Saban, Urban Meyer, any other coaches we could put there that would get that type of uh, uh, clout? Honestly, probably Harbaugh, but he, he's done a great job up there in Michigan. Oh, my God. How are you in Michigan and you can't get a quarterback? I don't understand that. Uh, I, but, mean, I mean, I don't know. Les, Les Miles probably would have, but he doesn't coach any for – the man just eats grass. He's awesome. Uh, so, how do you feel about the championship parade that UCF is about to throw? Do you think, honestly, they definitely they beat Auburn. They beat a really good SEC team. Do you, you know we've seen teams do this before where they claim part of the national championship? Do you think they deserve to uh, at least take some claim going thirteen and zero? I think it's pretty funny. I mean, let them do. Let them enjoy something. You know, shout out to the Dan Lebertard show. I don't know who their producer is, but he's the one that's coordinating. Uh, the parade over in um, Orlando, and he apparently has like 43 boxes of UCF national champion like shirts made, and he has no idea what the hell to do with them if anyone's gonna want them. <laughs> Did he invite Manfred? Um, I don't know. Well, Manfred is uh, completely different, but I know they invited. Uh, I think UCF is on board, and I know they invited like the athletic director. He's going and everything, which is <laughs> amazing. I was yeah. Shout out to Kyle Burns, UCF, uh, one of our buddies. UCF, uh, he goes to UCF. And, you know, shout out to him. I hope he makes his way down to Orlando to do it, um, to go to that parade. Now, big question for you. Right now, two SEC teams, good teams, but SEC, Southeast, really in one territory. How are the ratings going to be on Monday? Uh, fine. Do you, you think they'll Alabama, be all right? Alabama's in it, aren't they? I mean, yeah, but... Do you think it's Alabama and it's Georgia? I You expect Georgia to put up a fight. I think Georgia's going to get run over. No. Personally. I think it's going to be a close game. And, you know, and I hope it is in terms of, you know, all the championship games I think in the CFP have been pretty high scoring and pretty close, which is good for the CFP. They at least get two out of the four teams right, even though most of the other games are blowouts. But, um... So what do you think about the potential of going to an 18 playoff? I know me and Rob Planner have arguments about this all the time, but uh, what do you think? Because even if they went to eight teams this year, it would only encompass the Power 5 conferences would be the only representation in the 18 playoff. Uh, how would you feel about going to an 18 playoff? I'd like it. I'd love it, actually. I think it's a great idea, and I think it's the fairest way to find a national champion. And you see, and I completely agree, but the only thing I think they have to do, have to do to make this fair, is if you're going to go to 18 playoff, you have to include at least one mid-major. If they deserve it. If it's an undefeated mid-major, like a UCF, they should get a shot in an 18 playoff. If there is a one-loss mid-major and every other, like, big, like the big teams are one or two losses, all right, fine. Arguably keep them out. But... No, I agree. I agree. I think that it shouldn't... Uh, include another team that's not in one of those Power 5 conferences. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm trying, I'm looking at the article I wrote because I wrote that. All right. So the other four teams that would be in in 18 playoff would be Ohio State, Wisconsin, Auburn, and UC, uh, USC. That would be three SEC teams, two Big Ten teams, and one team from the ACC, Pac-12, and Big 12. Do you think that would be like a fair way to round it out? Because I don't think the SEC is honestly... Uh, do you think that they deserve to have three teams in an 18 playoff? Yes, because they play the best competition. I I don't think the big I think the big the Big Ten is uh, pretty overrated, and I mean the Big 12 nothing nothing spectacular. The Pac 12, are you kidding me? Who else are you gonna put in there? I mean you could put UCF in there. Maybe it takes out Auburn. Maybe it takes out Wisconsin. Maybe it takes out USC. But I mean these teams. 
they just not that spectacular. You otherwise. see, I compare Georgia to Wisconsin. Like, honestly, in terms of who they play. In terms of who they play every year in their side of the division. So, Georgia doesn't so, have anyone to get through. No, that's not true. Come on. I mean, so Georgia didn't play Auburn, and they didn't play and they didn't play Notre Dame. I, they did. They did play, and I think, you know, you put Notre Dame on more of a pedestal than I do. You're also a Notre Dame fan. I think Notre Dame, I think it's kind of funny that they use this claim of, we don't play in a conference, and we make our schedule, we make it so tough. Uh, get, get off your high horse, number one. Get in a conference and prove you belong. Do, but they prove do. you belong. But they do. You're telling me that, look, you want to hear the teams, that you want to hear their schedule this year? I'm about to look at it myself. I will gladly hear their schedule. All right, fine. Schedule uh, this year. I'll, I'll pull it up for you. I'll pull it up for you. I'll pull it up for you. I think I'm doing the same exact they thing play because Temple. I'm... They played Georgia. They played Boston College. They played Michigan State. They played Miami of Ohio. They played UNC. They played USC. They played NC State. They played Wake Forest. They played Miami. They played Navy. They played Stanford, and they played LSU. So you're gonna put that schedule up as the best in the nation? Best in the nation. Hands Temple's down. throwaway. We know that. Boston College is throwaway, even though we are better this year. Okay, UNC is a throwaway, so is Miami. So Ohio. is Michigan State this year. Michigan State's 18 just by, they were, uh, they, they were no, not they good. Were ranked when it happened. Though. They weren't good, but they weren't good at all at any time this year. North Carolina State, State wasn't good. Look at Clemson's schedule and talk about it. Wake, they were ranked when Clemson beat them. Wake Forest wasn't good. Uh, Miami of, Miami, uh, University. NC State was good. The U was overrated. We saw that. Navy was good, but Navy's just a tough. They they were not great. Come on, they're not. It, it, this year it wasn't the best schedule in the nation. It wasn't. They played a lot of good teams, but they didn't. They, they're it's a weaker schedule than they've had the in the past. The, is the best schedule in the nation, even in the national championship. I mean, it, it's a weaker schedule than they've had in the past. Can you agree with that? They had a lot of cream puffs on there, in, as compared to the past. Sure, but on paper, when you're looking at it, first day of the season. Week one, you're looking at that schedule saying we got a lot of work to do. I look I at, I'm looking at, look at it. Georgia, Michigan State, USC, Miami, and Stanford. Those are the scary teams. Which, if you're playing in a good conference, you have probably a, that same number, if not more, than tough teams. Fair enough. Notre Dame either needs to just align with the ACC, align with the Big Ten, one of one of the two, and just you know. Stop getting off, get off your high horse of we're independent and we play a tough schedule. I mean, it's a crutch at this point. I just look at it as a crutch, and well, maybe they it's they don't have that. They don't have the the uh, conference championship. They don't have a conference championship, but they also have an excuse. It's a built-in excuse. We lost three games because our schedule is difficult. That's all it is. Like to me, it's our schedule it's... is difficult. Uh, th- okay, yeah. but so is Bama. So is, you know, so is Bama. So yeah, but if Notre Dame went undefeated, if Notre Dame had one loss, if Notre Dame's only loss was that loss against Georgia, they're in the, they're, they're playing, they're playing, in, they played last week if that was their only loss. Okay, but you look, you said it yourself, the Pac-12 is laughable. So Stanford, are they really that big of a competition this year? Do does that like game or that? They lost to them, by the way. But yeah. that, that even shows even more that they lost to a weak Stanford in a weak Pac-12. All right. Like there's this argument for Notre Dame. Some years it can be made. Some years they're fantastic, but this year and most years that schedule is a crutch. They use it just to tout their way into, you know, a better bowl game or try to get into the championship. In the terms of the playoff, the way it is right now, Notre Dame is going to have to join a division, or a conference, or otherwise they're going to be left out more often than not. Probably. And. So that that wraps up our college football talk, which, you know, I actually just had a blast debating. That was fun. We're going to go on. We're going to stick with college, though. College hoops. I want to talk about Trey Young, who I know he's not. It's a great topic. Everyone's talking about him for good reason. The kid's averaging 29 points, nine assists a game, coming out of Oklahoma, uh, a Big 12 conference who's pretty damn good this year. What do you think of Trey Young? Is Trey Young legit? Is he going to be able to go into NBA and be a legitimate NBA player? Or is he just a college product like an Adam Morris and a Jimmer Fredette? Mm, mm. It makes me want to say he's just a college product, but I really don't know. But the, the nine assists a game. I think I mean, Adam Morrison had like... Games haven't been impressive, though. I think Adam Morrison averaged like two assists a game. Jimmer Fredette like three assists a game, along with numbers similar in terms of points-wise. 
he shows that he has crazy range. He can finish at the basket. His vision, great. He's being compared to Steph Curry from Davidson. Not current Steph Curry, what Steph Curry was in college, which I think is a fair comparison. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I really like what I see out of Trey Young. I think he's playing high-level competition over there in the Big 12. Big 12 is, you know, it's obviously not one of the big traditional conferences, but they have some good talent down there in the Big 12. Um, I think he needs to keep playing heavy minutes. Absolutely. I think that's a – he needs to play heavy minutes, but I he think – He has to get his, his field goal percentage up. These last three games, it's been abysmal, abysmal. It's been bad, but is that more of a case of – and this, I think, comes well, down to coaching. they him a lot. They're fouling him, and also they're playing him now. They're understanding that this kid's super well, talented, I mean, and we really got to – He probably just played the best defensive team in the country in West Virginia, and they lost by 13. But he wasn't the reason. He put up points. He got his assist. He His he turnovers. 30 sex, it's 30, sure. But sure, he got his he got his twenty nine. But I mean, he shot thirty six percent from the field, and ten of his points were from the charity stripe. For me, I think his issues. I think he had a good amount of turnovers in that game too. Yeah, and, uh, eight eight turnovers, yeah. and that's something eight he has turnovers. to clean up against better teams. But in terms of just pure talent, I think an NBA team would be happy to have him. Um, sure, sure. Do you see him being? A guy that can be built around in the NBA, a member of a big three, or just a solid starter at point guard. What do you think his ceiling is? Uh, ask me in March or April, rather. Ask me in April ask because me. right because I got to see what he can do. Right now, you're playing. What's today? It's January seventh. I does it. I don't care what you could do on January seventh. You might as well do it in the, in Battle for Atlantis. So, you know, speaking of March, speaking of April, uh, you know, we're talking about Trey Young because Trey Young is a story of college hoops. Outside of the fanatics, does anybody care right now until March? I mean, I, I, I look, I watch Seton Hall. I make sure Seton Hall is winning, stuff like that. But, I mean, until you start talking, until, you know, February creeps around and we, you got to start, you start looking at who's jockeying for position, I'd say it doesn't. The real fans don't start. Or the 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 ca- the more casual fans, their attention doesn't really get captured until probably first second week of February. I don't think anyone cares until UNC Duke is done for the second time. Like they pay attention to UNC Duke, uh, even the the one time, if unless they meet each other again in the ace in the championship game. But they pay attention to UNC Duke because you know what? I'm a Florida State Seminoles fan. You know just. My cousin went there. I've liked all their sports. They just ended up beating a pretty damn good Tar Heels team. Who knew? Who? Like, nobody cared that the Florida State Seminoles are a pretty legit team and probably will make some noise in the tournament this year. But no one's going to know that up until March until they're really competing in the ACC tournament. But who cares about the tournament unless you're a team that needs to get into the tournament? I mean, that that's true. That is very true. But, you know, it's funny that, like, I, the tournaments, the conference tournaments are an interesting thing to me because they could be throwaway because you already know who's going to, you know, make a lot of noise. But there's also teams that use that to vault them. Kemba Walker's Connecticut Huskies, when they won, it was because of the amazing play that they had in the Big East tournament and just how awesome they played and that it propelled them into the NCAA tournament and they just kept that momentum all the way through the championship. So it's different how you look at it because, you know, obviously Duke, Begley is going to turn it on in the tournament and he's going to be unstoppable. The ACC tournament doesn't matter to him, you know, Duke and those guys. But certain teams, I think, really need that. I would say the big, the biggest conference that needs a play a tournament is the Big East. Now, is the Big East, like, a Big East basketball is still good, good basketball. But can they ever get back to being the Big East? Um... I would say they're the big, well, they're not the Big East right now, but I mean, look at it year after year. Who who's top three in most bids? These team, these teams, the Big East every year. It's the, them in the ACC. The Big East is right there. They're still playing great basketball with all the Catholic schools and all the other and the other schools that are in the. Well, it's only Catholic schools now, other than a few of them. Yeah, I think it's but, only religiously affiliated teams for yeah. the most part. But I mean, you're telling me Villanova is not for real? You got. You got four teams, I'm pretty sure, that start that have two losses right now. And it, number five, Xavier, just lost to Pro, well, it just lost to Providence. Providence is going to be ranked next week. Butler is no pushover. They just lost to 
21 rated Seton Hall, but uh, they'll probably be ranked in a few weeks. Seton Hall is going to keep rising. Xavier's going to fall a few. Villanova is still Villanova. They're up at the top. Creighton's, Creighton was ranked already. They'll probably f- f- uh, get back into the rankings. I don't think there's any pushovers in this Big East. I think that they they get a lot of love, but they beat up on each other because it's that good. Any given day, one of these teams, unless you're DePaul or, or St. John, sadly, that poor St. John's. They don't know what's going on. St. John's can't. I don't know what they're doing down there. They lost at the ball last night. And that's that's sad. Now, do you think this is Seton Hall's year? Is this the year that Jersey really makes noise? For people that don't know, Seton Hall is a college in New Jersey. Everyone, I don't know if people know that Seton Hall's even in Jersey. They don't know where Seton Hall is. It's in New Jersey, everybody. It's you know. They probably Ru- think it's in Florida. They, you know, it's... Rutgers is the known school from New Jersey, but Seton Hall is the basketball school in New Jersey. And but you know what though? Shout out to Rutgers. Rutgers is not playing bad this year. They beat Seton Hall. They beat Seton Hall, and that was a huge win, an absolute huge win. And you know what? They're 1-3 and three in the conference. The Big Ten is a pretty legitimate conference. But overall, they're sitting at 11-6. and six. So that's one of the better years they've had to start. So, but yeah, this year could be Seton Hall's year. Do you think they have enough to, you know, make a run in the tournament? I mean, you have so many options. Yeah, Desi Rodriguez. If Delgado doesn't get it going, you have the six foot eight Desi Rodriguez. He's two hundred twenty pounds. He can move you over. You had a freshman on him yesterday, playing ball. We had a freshman on him. He he just took over the game. He lowered his shoulder just into the kid. That's it. Hey, if Desi Rodriguez doesn't go have it going, you have Powell. Powell doesn't have it going. You have Carrington. And of course, you have you have Delgado down low. You have the best post player in in the in the land. Now, He's, would this be a dream battle? Championships, Seton Hall, Duke, Marvin Bagley versus Delgado. Oh, Just Marvin, going Marvin to Bagley war. Can, physically would get would get bodied. But Marvin, Delgado. but uh, do you would think Bagley is more talented of a basketball player than Delgado? I think Delgado. Delgado, he leads the league. He leads the nation and probably in double doubles. I'm pretty sure he led it last year. Wouldn't be surprised if he led it again this year. I I just don't see Marvin. Marvin Bagley is a pretty skinny guy. Absolutely, but you know, and my only fear is for Seton Hall, if Villanova, they're fourteen and one overall. If they really do what they can do and really turn on, I think that they end up winning the Big East. I still, I Villanova is my pick to come out of the Big East as a champion anyway, and I think Nova can really go and make a run at a championship. More, I think they're my pick out of the Big East to make that run. Well, this is uh, Jay Wright said it's the best Villanova team he's had, so. And, you know, and it's funny, you just look, I'm just looking at the Big East Conference right now. You have Seton Hall 14-2, 3-0 in conference play. Creighton 13-3, 3-1 in conference play. Xavier 15-2, 3-1 in conference play. Nova 14-1, 2-1 in conference play. That's your top four teams. And between all of them, you have eight losses. Only eight yeah. losses in your top four teams. And look at the quality wins between the four of them. Uh, you know, I haven't looked at their schedules, but I can imagine they all play difficult uh, out of conference schedules. They're in the top like preseason, you know, early season tournaments. Uh, None of them are pushovers. I'm pretty sure. Wait, look at the. Hold on, let me get this this up real quick. I know exactly what I want to look at. Uh, let's see, rankings. The RPI rankings. They have this. This is the current RPI ranking. So it's one Duke, two Virginia, three Villanova, four Seton Hall, five Xavier. And where does Creighton say? Because I'm pretty sure Creighton's probably not that far low. Creighton is... Creighton's pretty far down, actually. I don't see Creighton. But Butler's 24. Creighton's 30. Creighton's 30. You know, the, 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 conference, uh, the, the conference organizers have quietly done a good job with the transformation of the Big East and, you know, the decimation of their football side. They quietly did a really good job of keeping Big East basketball really uh really up there in terms of if not the best conference top three conference in the nation no, no, no i i agree i mean as a big east fan i i think it's one of the i don't think it gets enough love that and the atlantic 10 don't get enough love just because the bottom of the atlantic 10 is really really bad but the top of the atlantic 10 rhode island watch out rhode island is good well, Rhode Island's legitimate. You have St. Joseph's, who usually makes some noise. Uh, St. Joseph's is awful this year. They're awful. They got, but... they got beat by my George Washington team. That team, we can't, 
we we can't shoot. We can't hit the side of a. We can't hit the broad side of a barn. The the <laughs> bucket could be the size of the ocean. We'd miss. Well, right? you know, but you got the some best. traditional tournament teams that make noise in the tournaments. There, VCU, uh, St. Louis, Richmond. Yeah. You know, LaSalle even comes to play every once in a while. David's uh, alma mater, George Mason. Bottom feeding with one and two in the conference, they're only seven and nine. I know nine is a lot of losses in college, but if they turn it up in conference play and make some noise in the tournament, conference tournament, there's no saying that George Mason can't get hot and win the division, get a get a get a seat in the dance. They'd probably be the thirteen seed again. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. Just you know. That this is the fun of college basketball, and you know, unless like Matt is an actual fan, and this is what I'm talking about, though. I'm more of a casual fan in terms of college basketball. I know of Trey Young, you know, I know of certain things where you actually delve your way into it. To me, I don't get interested, like you said, until the jockeying for conference position, until you know, there is the bubbles and the best of the rest, and you know, should get in, and like all that stuff really starts to come into shape. I really don't care. Like to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, and and I understand it's a lot to follow. There's so many teams. And you know, right now it's still football season for me. Once football yeah. season ends, and I'm a big, I'm a more of an NBA guy than I am a college guy, and I think that also has a lot to play with. Where I throw my, I know people hate the NBA because you know it, it seems like the guys aren't as passionate, and it looks like uh, it's they, like they don't care. But you know what, though? For me, it's just you're looking at a bunch of dudes. It's similar to the NFL. The talent level between LeBron James and Brian Scalabrini might seem like it's astronomical, but in terms of it really isn't super far. It's that little bit of a bet of like a difference in talent makes all the world when you're playing at that level. Yeah. So no, it's I just agree. I think it's just fun to watch. Like in college, there's a lot of bad college basketball games on ESPN all the time. Just bad, oh, yeah. unwatchable stuff. Where you look at the NBA, even the worst teams in the NBA, my Brooklyn Nets, you know, you make fun of them. They're considered one of the bottom feeders. But you go watch them play this year, they're an exciting team to watch. They shoot the three ball well. They run up and down the floor. They play decent defense. They're buckling down. Their defense has been a lot better over the last 10 games. So it's like, even in the NBA, you watch the worst teams, you're still going to get really good basketball. That's why I enjoy watching the NBA. No, I can't knock you. I, 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 I enjoy the NBA. I just, I just can't stand it. They just don't care. They just don't care. <laughs> They're making money. But speaking of the NBA and speaking of things that kind of scare me, you mentioned that it's only January 7th, so you can't judge, you know, college teams. Something really concerned me that came out in the news lately. The other day, Chris asked Porzingis what of your New York Knicks was talking about the season and the way things are going. And he happened to mention that the reason why his numbers are down in these past two games before, three games now, I think he's at 15 points, 14 points, and 10 points since the start of the new year. The reason why his numbers are down is because Chris Naps Porzingis is tired on January 7th, not even the All-Star break of 2018. Now, this concerns me because over his first two years of his career, he has shown to come out really strong at the beginning of the year and kind of peter off late in the year. He seems to be doing it earlier, and I get it. It's a lot of load on him in New York. He sees what Carmelo Anthony went through all these years. Uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. is tough to miss, but Ennis Cantor is taking all of that abuse down there on the block that Chris Porzingis normally would have to take. Does it concern you as a Knicks fan that Chris Porzingis is playing terrible and he's tired? Mm, no, because I no, it doesn't concern me because I know what he can do. I just think he has to maybe he has to get into better shape. Maybe he's still injured. I have to see. I but him being tired, sure, it's concerning. But it's one of those things you just got to get over it. I don't want to hear that you're freaking tired. We don't pay you millions to be tired. But Matt, can he be the superstar in the face of a franchise if he's at it's January seventh? His body, his body doesn't allow him. But since when the have you heard? Since when have you heard a superstar of any team besides LeBron James? These past three years, after putting every team he's ever had on his shoulders, he's finally started to say, "Yeah, I'm tired." You know, and he's earned the right to be tired. But I don't, I don't think. I mean, I think a lot of players say that they're tired. People are sitting out games for no for no reason anymore. 
people people are tired all the time. They just don't say it. But and they I think it's ridiculous. They always have built-in rest days. They've always had, you know, no player really plays 82 games. Mostly. I don't even... understand why this is the first time we're hearing about it. The schedules aren't that crazy. You want to look at a schedule that's stop go play hockey. You want to play a back-to-back game of hockey and tell me you're tired? Sure. You play a back-to-back game of basketball. Go play hockey. Go play Go play baseball. Honestly, you look at baseball, baseball is grueling physically because of how many games they play. Yeah, is it the hardest sport physically? Hell no. It definitely isn't. But in terms of the fact no, that they're playing, they're playing 162 games, traveling across the country maybe three times in two weeks. Yeah. Like, it's insane. Yeah, I don't want to hear it from these basketball players. I, I Basketball players are the worst people on the planet. And it's interesting, too, because I think they're even easier because now the way that they schedule the NBA schedules road trips with these guys, it's regional. You know, you go out to the West and you play four or five games in the West. You go out to Florida, you'll play the Florida teams and maybe Atlanta. They're all prima donnas. They're all prima donnas. You see how they treat the referees? They're prima donnas. Speaking of that, that, Spencer Dinwiddie got disrespected last night in a very close game that the Nets should have won against the Celtics. He, Spencer, yeah, stop that. Spencer Dimwitty, you know who it is. Exactly, that's why he got disrespected. Who the hell is that? All right, but three times he's driving the ball, gets destroyed at the net, and gets no call. And you want to talk to Carmelo Anthony about getting no calls at the end of the game? Oh, listen, you know I have always defended Melo when it comes to not getting superstar calls. Even when you guys were playing my Nets and when my Nets dominated you during the D-Will years, because we absolutely dominated the Nets during the, the Knicks. Besides Jeremy Lin's tenure, when Carmelo was the centerpiece, the Nets, the Knicks were the Nets babies. But I digress. But Melo never got the calls he deserved. And he still probably doesn't in OKC. I just don't watch him as much. I don't. Oh my gosh, I don't watch him either that much. So. But you know what though? I, I'm also tired of Knicks fans that still bash Carmelo Anthony. The guy was one of the rare players that wanted they're to not, do it at home. Knicks they're not Knicks. They're not Knicks fans. He wanted to do it in his home state. He wanted to do it for his home team. He wanted to really, you know, he, he wanted to be in New York. He took everything, and all he asked for was some help. So what do they get him? They get him a broken Amari Stoudemire. They get him a Tyson well, Amari Chandler. Amari was already there. But, they, but I mean in terms of like what they team him up with, they get him J.R. Smith. Like They get him a, a old Chauncey Billups. Like it, if, if Melo can go back to when he was on Denver and see the future of what he was going to have to go through, I don't think he would have ever left Denver. I, I hear you. I hear you. He may have came to the Nets. Because he was I like, oh, no. I, I feel bad for Melo, but like I said, I think Chris Stapps, I think Porzingis is going through what Melo went through. Because look at it, you guys were all hyped about Tim Hardaway Jr. And yes, he's been hurt, so I'm not going to hold that against him. But even when he was playing, he's not a second scoring option. He is a nice scorer, but he's not your second option. If you have him as your second option, then you don't have a second option. Well, what I like about Tim Hardaway is he. He can create his own shot, which not many people on the Knicks can do whatsoever. And we, what the hell is Courtney Lee doing? Why is he getting the ball and shooting every time? Uh, I couldn't tell you. He's, Courtney Lee doesn't. Courtney, Courtney, Courtney Lee still thinks he has an automatic mid range shot. It's crazy because he's getting away what made Courtney Lee a really good player, playing good defense, making open jumpers. And, you know, just being smart and being gritty. I mean, he's trying to do more than he has to. Like, it's ridiculous. You know, Ennis Cantor is doing his part. Ennis Cantor is the absolute oh, well, player you guys well. needed. And it, but it's like you something needs to be done at the at the before the All Star break or before the trade deadline because Porzingis does need help. Like yeah, I'm the not trade deadline doesn't matter in basketball. If you're not one of the top four teams in the NBA, there's no reason to trade because you're not going to get there. But if there's, you, no reason, there's but no reason to trade. I argue that if the Knicks get a legitimate second scorer, they can shoot themselves right up into that. Sure, but why make the playoffs unless you're going to compete in the NBA? That's the sad reality of this league. If you're not, if you're not in the top three in the in the East and not top three in the West, yeah, forget that. If you're not top two in the East and you're not top two in the West, uh, wait, actually, forget that. If you're not, if you're not LeBron or you're not the, the Warriors, why are you even making a trade? What's the point? See, I don't know. I think if you could get a legitimate star uh, wing player 
that can not guard LeBron because nobody can guard Who? LeBron. Who? I don't know. I don't know. That's DeMar why I'm not DeRozan? a GM. Do you want DeMar DeRozan? I mean, he would definitely make you guys a top two team in the East. You put DeMar DeRozan with Chris Ass Porzingis with the way Ennis Cantor is playing defensively and offensively, they are challenging both the Celtics and the Cavs. But they wouldn't be, they wouldn't beat the Cavs though. I think they would. Absolutely. They're more fit, I, they're faster. They are more physical. And the only thing you have to worry about is you can let LeBron drop 60. You will beat the team 100 to 60. That's that is true. Except, unless Kevin Love decides he wants to play like he has this year. I give Kevin Love some love because 20 and 10 a game, the guy's balling. He gets no recognition, no credit. Kevin Love is balling this year. Uh, Kevin Love needs some love. Kevin Love is Chris Bosh right now. He's still a uh, legitimate uh, Chris, superstar. Oh, that's disrespectful to Chris Bosh. Oh, no, come on. He, Kevin Love's a legitimate. Kevin Love and Chris Bosh are similar in the terms of, yeah, Chris Bosh was a better offensive player, but Kevin Love is a better rebounder. And he has nah, a better three. It, it, you put Kevin Love on those Miami teams, they don't win those. They don't win that title. They don't win those titles. I mean, you take Ray Allen off those Miami teams, they don't win that title. Well, get, or get, any get, other titles. titles. Come on. Come on. Hey, Ray Ray's that Ray dude. Ray. You take <laughs> Shane Battier off of those Miami teams, they don't win. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that is the truth, actually. Shane Battier, and I can't... You take Sean Marion off of that team, they don't win. Sean Marion has the quickest, dumbest shot I've ever seen in all sports. The release is uncanny. The release is a, it's a legitimate girl's release, like not to offend women, but it is a chest, quick chest release. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I don't know how people didn't swat him. Like, I don't get it. You just need to put a seven foot center on him and you will swat every jump shot he ever took. Can I talk about Hornacek for a second? Uh, why, what do you need to talk about Hornacek for? Uh, what, what's he doing? What, what's he doing? Her, Hernan Gomez gets no minutes. Jokey Noah gets no minutes. You, you say that you really like, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, Dotson. He doesn't get any minutes. Well, you're telling me this team, this team's not good enough to not be given these guys that you apparently love so it's much. It's because you guys have Hernan, Kyle O'Quinn. Kyle O'Quinn's the answer to all down low. But Hernan Gomez it was, it was he was first team all rookie. He's talking up Hernan Gomez so that teams want to trade for him. Only reason Hernan Gomez ever gets he talked hasn't about positively. Played. I wouldn't trade for him if he hasn't played. Why the hell not? You don't you don't want fresh legs down for the second part of the year you, with a kid well, that you, you know can play. You haven't seen Jaleel Okafor play, but now you now you sure as hell, you sure as heck know that he's out of shape. Yeah, but you know what though? He played 13 minutes, 12 points. He's getting there. Every time he steps on the floor, he's productive. Sure, but I mean, he can't. He, he can't defend. He's not quick. I mean, their time. Listen, their timing he's, his he's, minutes he's, he's, he's with Delo returning. Zemo could play more minutes than him. But their time. Listen, they're but you know what though? What, from what I've read, he's not out of shape because of himself. He's out of shape because of Philly. Philly just would get him on the practice floor and just make him stand there. Like he's not in basketball shape because they didn't use him at all. Like I feel kind of bad for the guy. But, you know, I watch him. He's fun to watch. There's not many big men that could throw a Euro step like Jaleel Okafor can. Yeah, that's, that, that's true. So, it's like, I, I'm, I'm not off of Okafor right now. I still, I wanted the Nets to trade for him. I wrote a piece on nothing but Nets preseason. I, you remember this one, how that the Nets should go get Okafor. So, I basically predicted that they were going to do it. But, um... I think I think we gotta see what Okafor could do. Okafor can play defense. He he plays. He's a big body. He doesn't get pushed around, which the Nets have needed for a long time. So the the jury's out on Julio Okafor. Don't be hating on Okafor just yet, okay? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I don't hate on him. I feel bad for him, but I mean, it's I'm a I'm a Knicks fan. It was, those Nets, it's like listen, you were you're like listening to Evan Roberts on the fan. If I wanted to listen to the Nets talk. Uh, I'd watch it. I'd be a Nets fan. Can't, I don't even know where I'm going with this. I, I don't know. You're just trying to say the fact that the Nets have no fans. And you know what? Point yeah, taken, okay? You know what, though? The Nets, I think, lost a lot of fans when they left New Jersey. Because I think there was a core group of people that actually liked having a New Jersey team besides the Devils. And when they went to Brooklyn, I think a lot of New Jerseyans were just like, oh, to hell with them. So they're rebuilding a fan base of a few loyal fans and a borough that 
is competing against one of the most established franchises in all but sports. Why don't they push their young stars? Why don't they push Karis Lever? Why don't they push Rondé Hollis Jefferson? And if you're a basketball fan, you know Rondé Hollis Jefferson is playing out of his mind right now. They're trying. Listen, we the the Nets PR is fantastic. They try. But that, why? But how? To push like they're, they play in New York City. They play in New York City, and I hear about them not often at all. I live in New Jersey. Let me tell you, Matt. Don't you think I should be hearing about them? And I agree. And, you know, they have to deal with the fan. And the fan is a big-time New York... Uh, but when, the... I hear, when I hear... When, but when I hear that no one wants to talk... But that's the thing. The fan's a bunch of older men. They don't want to talk about the Nets. They're talking about the, the Knicks. No one wants to hear about the Nets. Listen, the Nets have not... never. Listen, as a franchise... The Nets have not gotten respect. And I think a lot has to do with, and I think basketball people, especially older people, kind of hate them for giving the Sixers Dr. J. I still think that scorn exists where older fans <laughs> hate the fact that the Nets did what they had to do to get into the NBA, but they gave the Sixers a player that dominated the league for how long? And a long time. A long time. And, you know, so I think there's that. I think also the Nets with Drazen Petrovic passing away, that was the time where the Nets were going to become a perennial NBA power. Was He was going to be a scorer like we've never seen. They had, you know, Derek Coleman on that team. I think Bernard King was still, was he a net? No, he was long gone, I think, actually. But they had a good team, a really, really good team, a championship caliber team. And if Drazen Petrovic doesn't pass away, then the Nets, I think, are something that's good. Him passing away, the Nets not winning a championship when they had back-to-back chances. All these things have hurt the franchise. I mean, what also would have helped the Nets was you probably would have got a Nets-Knicks uh, playoff series. Yeah, probably would have gotten a Net- Nets-Knicks. And the last time the Nets and Knicks played in the playoffs, the Nets swept the floor with them with the great Jason Kidd's teams. I was too young to remember that. Oh, my God. The Nets beat the hell out of them. Kenyon Martin was just basically laughing in their face. What is that? Latrell Sprewell you were playing? I think it was Sprewell. Tim Thomas, I think, was on the team. Yeah, I could have beat that team. Come on. Uh, Yeah, they were the eight seed. The Nets were the one seed. But there was a playoff there. I think that's where the Nets will get their clout. I think, you know, the Knicks are obviously rising. I think the Knicks are a playoff team this year, if not next year. I don't think they're making the playoffs this year. I think they can make a run. There are things to be done. I think the Nets are coming. I don't think the Nets are as far off as people think. The the talent inequality in the NBA is atrocious. I mean, it is, but I think, you know, Brooklyn hasn't been... The money these players get paid is also atrocious. There's not enough talent in the league to pay these guys this much money. Chris Middleton, three year, two years ago, signed a three-year, $70 million contract. Well, can we talk about the contract that we're currently paying Timothy Mozgov? Well, but the contract we're paying Tim Hardaway. How about the contract... You're paying Joe Kim Noah. Tra- Trailblazers gave, what's his name? Uh, Alan uh, Crabb? Yeah, Alan Crabb. And well, that's our fault. Yeah, I know that's your fault. <laughs> we I did mean, that. That's a, but, but I shouldn't have to pay. There, there's no reason you should pay. The, the asking price should be four years, $70 million for a guard that might give you 12 points a game. Well, you could thank Larry Bird for guys that, you know, they invented bird rights, which lets you overpay for players that you have as veterans. You could thank LeBron for exploiting these TV deals and, you know, basically setting the standard where everyone trickles down off of what LeBron makes. So it really comes down to, and they're giving them more cap money. And when you have soft cap leagues, that's what happens. Look at baseball. Yeah. Do baseball players really deserve $350 million? No, but no, but the way players are paid in baseball is very fair because only the top make a lot of money. There are a lot of guys in baseball that don't make a lot of money, that travel, that play, it, that have an insanely hard job think about it. you're when you're on the road in baseball you're gone for probably two weeks at a time and think of the ronald Torreses. you're not playing every day oh i you're agree not, you're not playing and you're probably making only what seven hundred thousand dollars a year i take seven hundred thousand dollars a year what <laughs> i would take seven hundred thousand dollars a year yeah but i i mean sure you take it but i mean you look next to you you got john carlos stanton making all making making 26 million dollars a year and Aaron Judge looking at John Carlos Stanton going, oh, he only hit four more home runs than me. He's making $300 million over the next uh, God knows how many years. And I'm Aaron Judge on an entry level contract getting paid, getting paid 800 grand, not doing anything. All right, but I also think you're looking at two different games in two different leagues, though, where the NBA, 
so few guys can make a big difference. So you're trying to pay these guys, you're paying them off of what you think they could be in the future. That's really what it comes down to in the ABA. Chris Middleton got all that money because they because teams really thought that Chris Middleton could develop into a member of a big three. He did get hurt. He's still a very good player. But they're basically saying that big threes are all the craze. So you're paying guys that you think are going to be a part of your big three. And that's what they're paying for in the NBA. Yeah. And, you know, and the Nets... Uh, the Nets did what they did with Alan Crabb. They did what they did with Tyler Johnson because they just needed talent. They needed talent to start attracting other free agents to come. So, and I think right now with the way the Nets play and how tight they play, we're attracting, I don't, we're not going to get a superstar. But if D'Lo comes back healthy, plays well, Okafor starts actually playing, Spencer Dimwitty continues to progress, I think we could get a, not a superstar, but another star player to go with D'Lo and come as a free agent. I don't think that's out of the realm. No, I think you're correct. I think. I'm, I'm predicting Clay Thompson's the next net centerpiece. I've been saying that for a while. I think he's our I next net Clay centerpiece. Thompson should go to the Sixers. You see, that's crowded. It's crowded, it's crowded over there. Why would you want to play second fiddle to Ben Simmons and, and uh, Joel Embiid? Get rid of J.J. Redick, there you go. There's your three-point shooter. They, they don't shoot a good three. But I think the difference is, I don't think Clay Thompson wants to be a piece in a big three. I think he wants to be the focal point. I don't think he can be the focal point. Uh, you know, on the Nets, though, where he, I think he could carry the Nets. He could create. create. create Tom, Clay Thompson could create for himself. And he's one of the best defenders in the NBA. He scored, uh, he scored 20 points in one of these. I, I don't remember when it was, but they counted the amount of dribbles he took before in the amount of points compared to the amount of points he scored that's because he doesn't have to on this golden state team sure sure and but if you put him onto a team like the nets who models their style of play around golden state houston san antonio which is a motion ball offense he's still not gonna take a lot of dribbles because all it is is move the ball find the open shot it's a motion rhythm offense yeah so which uh, the knicks do when the knicks are playing at their best they play motion rhythm find Porzingis eventually open. <laughs> I, think, I think it's really open to to whatever you like, honestly. I agree. I completely agree. But, you know, uh, you know, it, this put is... The, put, I, I think if Clay Thompson wants to win, though, he can't be a focal point, just like Kyrie Irving. And I know that I, the next segment is Cavs or Celtics, and I'm taking Cavs because, you know what, the Celtics, not impressed. Now, are you impressed with the Raptors? They're having a great regular season again. No. Nah. <laughs> just nah nah no, I ask me about another East team uh, try, the Pistons are playing out of their mind what the hell are they doing nah but <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, let's think uh, you, know, you, know, you know that team that has LeBron on it they call the Cavaliers yeah they exist yeah yeah that, that's my pick again and they're gonna play a team called uh, uh, the Warriors They have. I'm pretty sure they have like Kevin Durant or or maybe James Harden on there, whoever it is. But the Warriors, that's my pick. Now, can we agree that Tenacopo is the closest thing in the East to LeBron? Uh, in terms of just doing everything for his team? I mean, he's going to be the best player in the NBA after LeBron. Whenever, whenever it is, I don't know. I don't know if it, it could be next year. It could be – no, it's not going to be next year. But it could be two years from now or it could be four years from now if LeBron retires then. Now, does whenever a young athletic Bucks team – push a Cleveland Cavaliers team to seven games and possibly win because of a Tenacopo. He's one of the, can run them out of the run them out. And he's one of the rare guys with Kawhi Leonard style type of defense with length and Andre Iguodala with length, with some physical ability that can slow down LeBron. He can't, no one stops LeBron, but he could slow him down. Do you think that like out of every team in the East, I think the Bucks have the best chance to beat the Cavaliers. They're the best matchup. Yeah, I think they have the best match. I don't think the Celtics match up well with them. Yeah, because you know what? Getting rid of Avery Bradley, he's on the Pistons now. Avery Bradley was the guy that always stepped up and played LeBron. And Marcus Smart's not really tall enough to guard LeBron. Marcus Smart's more of a point guard. Any of the flop artists. Marcus Smart, oh, since when did he become a small forward? Who the hell, who the hell lists him as a small forward? Because the NBA, I'm whoever's in charge of that. Well, because a six-eight power forward now plays center. So that's the modern NBA. Yeah. Well, it's imperfect. 
Uh, but I, 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 it's gonna be the, the the future of the NBA is the Sixers, the Bucks, the Warriors, and the Timberwolves probably. You think Jimmy buckets? And you know what? It, uh, you know what? The Bulls will be okay. Oh come on now. No, this is my prediction. The Bulls will be okay. Well, yeah, the Bulls will be okay because they're sitting 13th in because the conference now, the first pick and they're going to get the first pick. Absolutely. The they NBA is going to rig Bonner. it. They have Zach Levine coming back. That Markinen figures it out. They play good team basketball. Okay, hold on, but here's my factor, though. Hoiberg is a good coach. All right, but stop. It's either the Lakers or the Bulls because the Lakers are sitting down there in last two. Out of the perennial powers, who does the NBA rig it for? <laughs> Not the Knicks. No, nah, they bring it for the Lakers. What do you mean? They bring it for the Lakers. They and don't bring it for the Bulls? Did you see what Lonzo Ball said today? I mean, not Lonzo Ball, LeVar Ball. Oh, but about LeBron? No, about Luke Walden, how he lost the team. LeVar has lost oh, his sons. Like, <laughs> Oh, my God. This guy. Oh, my God. He should have left his sons in jail. <laughs> no, he should thank Trump for getting him out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the hell with him. But yeah, no, Lavar. What do you mean he lost his team? Your son's been hurt, number one. And when your son your was son's playing, been garbage when he has played. But you know what though? I did talk with Colt about this. The last few games, Lavar has been. I mean, Lonzo has play been playing him. better. Play three feet off the guy. He's not gonna shoot. He's not gonna. His jump shots not scaring me. Oh, I agree. It doesn't scare. If he develops one, then yeah, he's a legitimate player because he does see the court really well. You, if you could go left, if you could go left and right. Who the hell cares if you can't pull up and make it? Oh, I, you know what though? That's what was said about Jason Kidd. And Jason Kidd has cemented himself in one of the top three point yeah, guards. But he also, how long did he work on that three point shot for? Literally for this whole time as a Phoenix Sun. <laughs> yeah. And he worked on it. He was still one of the best in the game then. No, I, I mean, we will see. We will see. I, I don't know, but I think Chris Dunn is. A future good point guard in the NBA. I think Chris Dunn's almost already done. I see nothing in Chris Dunn. Really? Yeah, no, I don't see Chris Dunn being... I think Chris Dunn can have a nice few years and, you know, stay on a team. I don't think Chris Dunn's a star in the NBA. I don't know. He pushes the pace. He makes good passes. I mean, he's young. All right, nobody pushes the pace and sees the floor better than John Wall. But what's John Wall and the Wiz doing? Are they a threat to anyone right now? No, because his best his player next to him is Bradley Beal. There's there's that uh team, there's rumors of Boogie Cousins coming. To one another. They are cancers to one another. There's to rumors of Boogie Cousins coming to Washington. Does that make a difference if he goes? Is Bradley Beal still on the team? Uh he might be a part of it, but it might be but they might because be able to get rid of up. you gotta break that up before you, you do anything else. Now, I compare what the Wizards do with Bradley Beal and John Wall to what Portland does with Lillard and McCollum. Do you see a similar thing where there's just too many shooters on one team with like two got too many guys that want to do the same exact thing? I think Lillard needs to take a back seat a little bit. You think McCollum's better than Lillard? No, I don't think McCollum's better than Lillard, but I think Lillard thinks he's better than he actually is. I mean, Lillard's earned the right to be called one of the best point guards in the game. He, uh, sure, he's uh, best point guard. One of the I wouldn't call him as the best. I, the guy, the guy, the guy who averages five, the guy who averages five assists a game. I don't even know if I can call him a point guard. I mean, point guards point don't guards. Ass, don't pass the ball anymore. No, that's true. So, I would just say he's a poor man, Russell Westbrook. I mean, you can argue that Russell Westbrook isn't a point guard either. Russell Westbrook is a smaller LeBron. Yeah, he, well, he is. Like, that's just all. He's just a smaller LeBron. He could do anything on the floor. If he was LeBron's size, we would just have LeBron versus LeBron. That's all it would be. <laughs> like, they, they play the same exact style, except Russell has more of an edge. He has a Kobe edge to him. <laughs> he has a UCLA edge to him. Russell hates everybody. I love, you know, can, can we talk about how much I love the fact that Russell Westbrook literally hates everyone but his own teammates in the basketball while playing? And in, in, in the NBA How season, like Paul George, though. I mean, I don't know why you hate Paul George so much. The guy, because he doesn't care. He seems like a nice guy. He seems like a nice. He just, he's just one to blame everyone else. I mean, what did Indy do for him to really help him besides get rid of uh, Granger? I, I mean, I don't know. 
Uh, you got rid of the only other guy that had any star talent on the team when he was on it. I mean, he had David West. Come on. Uh, David West is a good player. David West is a good player, but are you going to tell me that you're winning a championship because of David West and Paul George alone? All I'm saying is Paul George isn't putting up exactly. Uh, let's let's uh, look at this perennial all-star numbers. He doesn't have to with Russell being there. But that doesn't matter. Yes, it, it does. Are you going to tell me that? Are you going to tell me that Dwayne Wade is any less of a player because he took a backseat to LeBron? Even on the Miami Heat, but even on the Heat, was he any less of a superstar? No. No, Neither is Paul George. Average, not, but he wasn't scoring in the teens every game. Well, that's because LeBron James was more of a facilitator. They Uncle Russell doesn't care. Uncle Russell doesn't care. You're telling me a guy with with you're telling me a team with Russell Westbrook, Paul George, and Carmelo Anthony can't get above 500. Oh, time out real quick. I was looking at the best big threes on Bleacher Report. And Carmelo Anthony wasn't included in their big three. They included Stephen Adams. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> it was Westbrook, George, and Stephen Adams with his bro mustache just chilling. Oh, I Stephen Adams, not that good. <laughs> All right, but Stephen, but you know what though? No one's gonna go after Russell Westbrook, Paul George, or Carmelo Anthony with Stephen Adams standing behind them. I'd go after him. He's <laughs> one of the only dudes that I will say could talk trash to Boogie Cousins, and I would love to watch that fight because I think they would both just pound each other for hours. Oh, yeah? You'd watch that? I can't stand anything about you. And on that fantastic note, we're going to wrap up this edition of the Sports Opinions Podcast. But before we go, I do have to ask you a question. Something you were not prepared for. The spontaneous question of the day. Do you prefer snack pack puddings or Jell-O? Neither. I guess snack pack pudding, but I mean, why would you go with snack pudding? Wait, 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 wait. Jello as in Jello brand pudding or like actual gelatin? Um, I was gonna go Jello as in gelatin, like just actually Jello, uh, like itself. If it was je- no, if this was a question between Jello brand pudding and and snack pack brand pudding, it's Jello brand pudding. Oh really? You're a Jello brand over snack pack pudding person? I mean, what else, what kind of person? Are, uh, what, you're a snack pack pudding person? I grew up on snack packs. I would have my jello was gelatin and my pudding was snack pack. Well, the, you know what? This has been eye opening to say the least. <laughs> hey, listen, you could blame Adele for that, okay? <laughs> uh, I'll tell her. You need to tell her that. But all right, all right Matt, thank you very much for coming on. Um, let the people know where they can find you on Twitter and Instagram. Oh, uh, you can find me on Instagram at msantos period underscore and on twitter at m underscore santos seven so give me a follow yeah if you want to banter just give me a shout out absolutely and you can find me alex cuesta at a cuesta nbn and you can also find the official sports opinions twitter at sport opinion 30 i want to thank everyone again for listening thank you again matt for coming on thank you for having me alex and this was sports opinions episode seven the podcast So long, everyone.